today's stuff we're going to be learning is Sota Daf Yutet. We're going to finish up the second chapter and start with the third. So if you remember, we were finishing up this topic of a three-way machloket. Okay, let's pull up the study guide and we'll be able to see the chart it out there. Okay, we have this case of a woman who, can she drink the Sota waters twice? That's what we want to know. Is it possible to put, right, if you think about this, terrible ceremony this woman has to go through, is it possible we can make her do the, that kind of ceremony more than once? So according to Tanakama, yeah, no problem. We can make her do it more than once. According to Rabbi Yehuda, no, she can't. Although then Rabbi Yehuda came and quoted Nechun Yochofer Shechin, a guy who was a well digger, who basically said that she could, even though Rabbi Yehuda said she couldn't, so he said, we accepted his testimony who comes to two different husbands, but not one husband. One husband is not allowed to do that. And we talked about that yesterday about this was a way to minimize husbands from continually being suspicious of their wives. The rabbi said, she never is allowed to drink twice. Whether she's married once, whether she's married twice, whether it's two different husbands bringing her, it doesn't make a difference. She can never drink twice. She went through the ceremony once. We do not make her do it again. So now Rava comes and says, and we ended with this question, because we had this pasuk, Zot Torah Taknot. This is the rules of Knaot, of, you know, cases of jealousy, or however we, deter, we define that word, Knaot. Knaot is plural, Zot is singular. So Zot comes to say only one. Knaot comes to say more than one. So now we're stuck because the rabbi said more than one and ignored the word Zot. And, sorry, Tanakama. And the rabbis said... Only Zot, and he ignored the word Kna'ot, because they said you can't do it twice. So how do we ignore that? Where's Rabbi Yehuda kind of fits in the middle? Because he's got a case of Zot, and he's got a case of Kna'ot. He's got a case where it's only one, that's with one husband. He's got a case where it's multiple, which is if she's married twice, and each husband suspects her. But what do we do with Tanakam and the rabbis? They each ignore the other pasuk. So two lines from the bottom of you, kind of a bet, we're going to start. I'm a rabbi. Rabbi says the following. For here we have a chart. He's going to say there's four cases, okay? We thought two cases, one husband, two husbands. But now we're going to see, well, it also, there's all different permutations. There's how many men was she suspected with? Was it the same man, even though there were two different husbands, but each time she was suspected of cheating with the same man? Or there could be one husband with two men, two different men he suspects. There's one husband with one suspect, you know, where he wants to suspect her twice. There's, all different options. So we'll go through all of them now. Comes Rav and he's basically going to say they all agree about both extreme cases, which is what? That's because we're still trying to find how do the rabbis view the zot when they say the woman, right? Sorry. They say the woman can't. Um, so how do they use kna'ot and how does Tanakama use zot? So now Rav is going to say very simply, Dichtiv zot. Say the following. Everyone agrees if there's one husband and he suspects her with the same man twice, we definitely don't make the woman drink. Everyone agrees she doesn't drink. Even Tanakamu who said the woman could drink twice, not in that case. Because it says Zot, and there's your limitation of Zot according to everyone. And on the other extreme, we have Shnei We have two different husbands and two different suspects. She was cheating with one guy with one husband, and the second husband suspected of cheating with someone else. She clearly drinks twice, then one has nothing to do with the other. Dichtiv, Torah, and that's where we get it from Torah Knaot. It's really the plural of the Knaot. It comes to say multiple. Kipligi, the machloket is in the two in between cases. What are we left with? Which options? Isha chadu shnei ba'alim, the husband, one husband, but he suspects her with two different men. B'shnei anashim uboel, sorry, and b'shnei anashim uboel echad. Two husbands, but one man that she's suspected of cheating with. So now how's it going to work out? Tanakama Savar, remember, Tanakama was the one who said the woman could drink more than once. So he's basically going to say, other than that one case of one husband and one suspect, all the other cases, Tanakam Savar, Torah, Lirabu Yekulu, Zot, Lemiuti, Ishachad, Boel Echad. So the Zot comes to exclude just that one case. Otherwise, Haisha Shotav Shona, in all other three cases, as long as it's not the same husband with the same man she's suspected with, but 
one has been two men, she sees, rightly suspects her of being with other two different men, or two men who both, right, two husbands who both suspect her with the same person, or two husbands and two suspects, obviously she's going to then drink. That's the Tanakam. On the other extreme, we have the Chachami, who they were more, they said the woman never drinks twice, to which we said, well, she does in that one case where there's two men and two Baalim. So Rabbanan Batrai Savre, the last rabbis, meaning to distinguish them from Tanakama, Zot take Kulu, and Zot limits all the cases other than the one case. So we have the plural, specifically to say the only case where she can drink twice is if it's two husbands and they each suspect her with two different men. For Rabbi Yehuda, what's he going to say? So he's in the middle. So now the question is, how does it go? If you remember, let's just go back for a minute to Rabbi Yehuda. What did Rabbi Yehuda say? The woman doesn't drink twice. However, he said, there was this case that Nechunya said, right? He testified that the woman could drink twice. And what did he say? We accepted his testimony with two men, but not with one, right? Two husbands. So now we're going to say, how does that work out then? Very simply, the split between the four cases is going to go one husband, two husbands. So again, we're going to read it. He's going to say, Zot comes to limit. Woman doesn't drink in two cases. And, and Torah comes to include, she does drink twice. Ah, that's in two cases. So which two? Isha chadu bo'el echad, isha chadu shnei bo'alim. Sorry, I, I skipped the... Zot le mi'ute tarte. The, the limitation of the woman doesn't drink twice is all with one husband and one suspect, or isha chadu shnei bo'alim, or one husband and two suspects. Because remember, for him it all broke, boiled down to one husband or two husbands. So one husband, doesn't matter how many suspects, she doesn't drink twice. Torah comes to include two cases, which is going to say, if it's two different husbands, it doesn't matter how many men she was suspected with, if it's the same man, if it's a different man, either which way, she's going to have to drink twice. So that's how we end up with the split and the three-way machloket, and how each one does have some zot and some knaot, right? Some limitation of she doesn't drink twice, some case where she does drink twice, and Rabbi Yehuda had, you know, the most split where two and two, as opposed to one and three, or three and one. Hadron Allah Hayam Evi, with that we finish the second chapter. Now we're moving on to chapter three. Chapter three continues, we're continuing along the chronology of the ceremony, and we'll have a little bit of confusion about the chronology in our mission here. There's going to be a very big machloket, that's going to be the main topic for today. What's the order of the mincha offering, the meal offering that we've been discussing, and the water, the drinking the water. If you remember, we talked about the meal offering. Then we went to deal with the erasing of the Megillah. And now, right, she hasn't yet drunk the water, right? We did the, the oath. And now the mission goes back to the mincha, okay? And it says, So he would take, who's he? The Kohen, would take the mincha from this basket that they brought it in, this, this Egyptian basket, which we dealt with before. And then he puts it in a sanctified vessel. We had a whole discussion about that whole thing previously, which is what they generally did with the mincha. They would put it in the temple into a sanctified vessel, and that would make it sanctified. And then he would put it into the hands of the woman, Sota. And the coin would put his hands underneath her hands. And then they would wave it together. Now, there's a whole huge discussion in the Rishonim and the like the commentaries. How could he be touching her hands, right? It sounds like their hands are touching, and that doesn't seem like an appropriate thing of a man, the coin's hands touching the hands of the woman. Whole discussion about how this could be. This whole question about how it really went. Was it that actually physically her hand was on top of his hand? Or was it that she holds the vessel higher up than he does, and he holds the vessel lower down, and they do the waving like that, where their hands aren't actually physically touching. Okay, there's a whole debate. Can they physically touch? Can they not? Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? I'm leaving that issue aside just so you know that it exists. Now what happens? So Hanif, that they did the waving. Vihigish, and then they bring it to the altar. The coin brings it to the altar. Kamatz, he takes out the kmitza. That's when he takes his three middle fingers. And he takes a little bit of the dough from there. That's the central part of it. 
that part he takes and burns on the altar, right? We did the whole process. He puts it in a vessel. Also, he puts it on the altar. He vihiktir, and he burns it, okay? Then, hasharne echal kohanim. Okay, we already know this, right? And then the rest gets eaten by the kohanim. Whatever's left in that in that bowl is then, you know, the kohen could cook it, do whatever he wants with it, bake it, right? That's his, that's for him to eat. Now, hayamashke. Now it says, and then he would have her drink, but not then. Now it's confusing. We just said you do the mincha, and now it sounds like, and then you drink. She drinks the water. But it says here, Tanakama says, first she would drink the water, then you would do the mincha. Okay, the Gemara is going to ask, why is it saying this after it just brought the mincha? It should have then started, she drinks, and then it should have described how the process of the mincha works. Okay, in a few minutes, we're going to get to read all this in the verses and see where they get it from and why there's confusion. Okay, but we'll get to the Pesukim soon. So according to Tanakama, right now, she brings the mincha, right, the, they wave the mincha together. He brings it, sacrifices it, but all that was actually done, according to Tanakama, after she drank the soda water. Rabbi Shimon Omeo, makrivet minchatava, har kachaya mashke. No, mashka. First, you would do the mincha, then she would drink the water. And this, by the way, is going to match a further a Mishnah later on that they're going to say. I just want to connect this so that when you get there, you'll see it. It talks about in, the, in an upcoming Mishnah that when the Kohen, when I'm sorry, when the woman drinks the water and then we start to see some reaction in her body, like it's taking its effect, which makes us think that she's guilty, they immediately take her out so she doesn't create impurity in the temple. We'll talk about what impurity exactly, but... But basically, they start immediately removing her. And they say that must go according to Rabbi Shimon. Because according to Rabbi Shimon, that's the last part of the process, is the drinking. According to Tanakama, you still have to do the mincha, which means the soda water shouldn't start working until the mincha is actually sacrificed. So this machloket is going to come up soon also. It's a very basic machloket in terms of the order of the ceremony. What do you do first? So again, the rat and all this we're going to see in the verses and where they get it from, and you're going to see that there's a lot of confusion in the verses or things that are redundant, unnecessary, out of order. It's very confusing, and we'll see all the problems coming up. So Rabbi Shimon says, So first the mincha, then the drinking. How do we know this? Shinema, in the Pasuk that describes the mincha, okay, it says, That appears after the Pasuk. Where it talks about he gish he, right the tnufa the the bring it to the altar etc. Then it says he takes from the right kamatz he takes the kmitzah tiram is becha he burns it on the altar and then what does it say va'achar yashke teisha tamayim. What does that mean? And after that he makes her drink the water. So Rabbi Shema says there's my proof in the pasuk. Now you have to wonder why the rabbis didn't bring their pasuk their proof. Just only brings Rabbi Shema, but you'll see when we get to the pesukim. That Tanakama actually is more the simple reading, even though right now we're reading this out of context and he seems to have the obvious answer, but we're going to see that the rabbi is actually even more obvious. But we'll have to get there. So let's just wait right now. So it says, after you do the mincha, the woman drinks the water. So it seems pretty clear that that's the order. However, he says, im hishkan, Tanakama says, this is the order, period. Okay? Meaning they don't think that there's any wiggle room, but. Rabbi Shimon says, listen, I disagree with you about the order. However, I agree with you that what we call bidievet, post facto, if you did it in the wrong order, it's still okay. If she drank the water before the mincha was offered, and then they brought the offering after kshera, that would work as well. Okay, so Rabbi Shimon basically disagrees with the, with the rabbis about the order and thinks again that first the mincha, then the drinking of the water. But he says, if you did the wrong order, it's okay. Whereas the rabbis say, no, no, no. It has to be done in this order. First drink, then bring the mincha. Okay, the rabbis are very clear that it's an opposite order, and that's the only way to go. So again, all this we're going to understand better as we go on. But first, we're going to go back to the beginning part about the waving. Okay, waving, by the way, is a process that we see in a bunch of cases of uh, sacrifices. The Shtealechem, for example, on Shavuot, they would wave. They, they, it was a ceremony they would do. In fact, the Nianua Lulav, the shaking of the Lulav, is often compared to the waving. Um, there's two approaches about it, but some compared to the waving in the Gemara. And we saw that in Sukkah. So this was a process they would do, and they do it here also. 
So now, Amar le Rabbi Elazar le Rabbi Yoshaya didari. So Rabbi Elazar says to Rabbi Yoshia of his generation, that's what it means, the Rabbi Yoshia that lived in his generation, Lo teitu vakarach ad mefarshal alaha milta. I'm not sitting down on my feet until you explain to me the following thing. How do we know that the mincha of the sota needs waving? Right? Very much bothering him. To which the Gemara says, why on earth was he so bothered by this? Minan, what do you mean from where? Look at the Pasuk. It's in the Pasuk in the Torah. You don't ask questions about what's the source for this without looking in the Torah first. It says it explicitly. Let's read the Pasuk. We're going to be very familiar by the end of today with in verse, right, we're in chapter 5 of Bamidbar, which is where the whole Sota ceremony takes place. We're going to read verses 24, 25, 26, and 27. We're going to know them really, very well by the end of today. So right now we're on verse 25. The Lakach HaKohen, the one we read before about Achar Yashke was verse 26. The Lakach HaKohen Yad Eishan in Chatzakneot, the Kohen, now pay close attention. The Kohen takes the Mincha from the hands of the woman, in other words, she presumably brought it into the temple, he takes it from her hands. Notice who does the tenufa on the pasuk? The Kohen. Okay? He waves the mincha before God. And then he brings it to the altar. So, how could you possibly ask how do you know it needs tenufa? It says so in the Torah. So they say, no, no, no. What he was really asking was not how do we know about Snufa in general. What he was asking is, notice the Pasuk says only the Kohen does the waving. Where do we get this? That the Kohen and the woman and the owner of this Mincha offering does the waving. So the Gemara says, ah, now, or maybe Rabbi, um, Rabbi Yoshia answered him, and he says, Ad ye yad yad It's going to be what we call a Gzera Shava from the Shlamim. Shlamim is peace offering. Gzera Shava is when two words, the same word appears in two different places, we can learn one from the other. So now we're going to learn things from the Shlamim to the Sota and from the Sota to the Shlamim, because it often goes in both directions. So now, when it comes to the Shlamim, also there's Tnufa, a waving. Okay, it's, it says in Vayikra Zayin, Pasuk Lamed, Yadav Tivi'ena et Isha Hashem. Okay, his hands bring it. Whose hands? The hands of the owner. Bring the, okay, we're going to talk about, we're talking about the Chelev. We take the Chazeh. Um, I think it's also the Chazeh and the Shok and the, and the Imurim, the in, inside parts. And they wave them, those parts of the Shlamim, before God. Who does the waving there? The owner. So now you're going to see, by the Sota it says the Kohen. By the Shlamim it says the owner of the sacrifice. So now they say, well notice it says here, Yad Yami Shlamim. Ktiv Hacha by us, it says, Velakacha Kohen mi Yad Aisha, from the hand of. Uktiv Hatam Yadav Tibi Enu, his hands bring it. So you have hands of the woman by Sota. You have the hands of the owner by the Shlamim. Makan Kohen, Afla Halan Kohen, just like by us, the Kohen does the Tnufa and the Sota. Also in the Shlamim, it's going to be the Kohen in the end, they're going to learn. In both cases, it's the Kohen and the owners together do it. Umala Halan Baalim, Afkan Baalim. Okay, so we're going to learn from one, it's the coin, from one, it's the owner. We're going to say, ah, this one explains, right? Now, it's a little bit confusing. If this one is, right, we already know the answer, which is both of them, but now they're saying, if this one's the coin, that one has to be the coin. And if this is the owner, that one has to be the owner. So, ha, ketzad, how do you do both? So they say, right, one hand has to be under the hands of the other, and together they do the tnufa. So by the shlamim, it's the owner and the coin, and by the mincha sota, it's the owner and the coin. Now we're going to go on and ask that question that we asked about the order of the Mishnah. The Mishnah said, hey, nifi, gish, kamatz, etc. Then it said, he would have her drink the waters, hayam ashke, v'achar kach makhribem and chatan. Then they would bring them in coffee. To which the Gemara says, ha'ay kerva, but what do you mean? We already said a minute ago, they sacrificed the mincha. It sounds like the sacrificing of the mincha comes first, and then the watering, you know, the, the drinking of the sota. So, hachi kama, they say, no, this is how you should read the Mishnah. Seder minachot ketzad, right? How does the mincha offering work? Okay, let's talk about the mincha and the process of the mincha. Higish vehini, I'm sorry, hinif vehigish kamatz viktir. They wave, they bring it to the altar, they do the kmitzah, and then they burn it. Vashar nechal akonim, and what's left gets eaten by the konim. And then they go back and they say, since it's not clear 
this is a problem, right? When you want to, it's, it's not, it's, it's one dimensional, the Mishnah, right? You want to, it's very hard to show that we want to say there's a machloket. Does the drinking go first or does the drinking go second? So we have to add it either before or after. So they add it after and they say, And when it comes to the drinking, there's this debate, where does it go? Does it go before or does it go after? So that's how you read the Mishnah. And it's don't say, oh, we read the Mishnah, you bring the Mincha, and then you drink, but wait, but the drinking was before, something doesn't make sense, right? And then you bring the Mincha, we just talked about the Mincha. So they said, no. First they dealt with the Mincha, and then they said, and now if you want to know, by the way, when it comes to the drinking, there's a debate. Does it go before the Mincha, or does it go after the Mincha? And then they're just repeating the approaches. The rabbis say, first the drinking, then the Mincha. And Rabbi Shimon said, Because it says, and after you drink, and it says it in the Mincha, it says, and after that you drink, so Rabbi Shimon says it's the opposite. First the Mincha, then the drinking. Now they're going to quote the last line, even though really it's all the lines, but right? Rabbi Shimon had said, but if you do it in the other order, it works. Okay, and now they say, or really maybe you could just read that as a, as a actually, Right. It's probably just more a connect. It's a continuation of that last line, which is Rabbi Shimon says, you do it in this order, but if you did it in the other order, it would work also. Okay. Now we go to Amubet. And here we're going to get into, it's a little bit complicated, but we're going to deal with the Psukim, where everybody gets it from, and what's going on. And we're going to add to this picture Rabbi Akiva, who didn't appear at all before, who doesn't really disagree with the rabbis or Rabbi Shimon, what he's going to say everyone actually agrees with, but he's going to basically say something and he's going to use it from the drasha that we're going to, from words that we're going to darshan otherwise for Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis. And that seems to be, because he appears here in a bright day, he's not exactly disagreeing, but it's a little bit of a difference in how he reads the verses. So before we start, I want to read the verses in the Torah. Okay, so if you look at your study guide on the second side, or you can open up anywhere if you want uh, uh, chumash, we're going to read now these four psukim I mentioned, 24, 25, 26, and 27, in chapter 5 of Bamib. It says, and I want you to notice how many times it says the language of Hishka. If you see it here, you'll see it bolded on the sheet. So it starts off with, V'hishka et ha'ishad me'amarim ha'marim. So the coin makes the woman drink. Hishka is a, is a verb of somebody causing someone else to do something. So he has the woman drink the waters, the bitter waters, and they go into her body as bitter. Then, so it says she drinks. That's the first pasuk. Then it says, Then he takes the mincha offering from her. And he does the tnufa. And then he creeps it on his bath. He brings it to the altar. Then Then he does, right? So now you see why the rabbis didn't need to prove their didn't need to bring a pasuk to prove it because it says very clearly she drinks the water, right? And then we do the mincha. So that's the rabbis very simply in the pshat. The problem is, as we saw already, which is Rabbi Shimon's proof pasuk, which is at the end of the kmitza and the burning on the altar of the of the mincha, it says, Va'achar But then it says, and after that she drinks the water. So now you're super confused because it says she drinks, they bring the mincha, and then it says, and after she drinks the water. So it makes no sense. And now you realize why there's this debate here. And then, if that wasn't enough of confusion, in Pasuk of Zion, it says, Vishka tamayin. And he makes her drink the water. Vayayim nitma'an. If she was guilty, then this is going to happen. If she's not guilty, this is going to happen. Okay, I didn't even bring the next Pasuk, which says, if she's not guilty, then she'll have children. Okay, but, you know, that's like a blessing she gets. But the point here is not what happens. The point is, Right? We just finished the sugya about the swearing, the oath. And we said it said he makes her take an oath twice. And again, we saw there was a debate. Does it mean really there are two oaths or really is there only one oath? Here also, if you read the simple pshat, it would sound like she drinks at least twice, right? The hishka, the hishka. But she clearly doesn't drink the waters twice. So what's going on here and what do we do with these psuki? So the first brighter we're going to see, okay, the first chart here isn't really all found in the first brighter, okay, but part of it is. Part of this is the first brighter, and part of it, I combine the two brightas into one chart because later we'll get to the rabbis. But for right now, we're ignoring the rabbi's opinion. This brighter has nothing to do with the rabbis. We're going to have a machloket between Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Akiva. But it's not really a machloket. I shouldn't say a machloket. We're just going to have two different drashot 
of the Psukim. So the question starts off with the Brita starts, Tanu Rabbanan, again, top of Amud Bet. Vihishka Matamud Lamal. It's a bit of a debate between the commentaries, which Vihishka we're talking about. Which one do they say is unnecessary? So Rashi, and we're going to go with Rashi for right now, it's not so critical, but which way we go here, but they're basically going to say it says Vishka twice, once in Pasuk 24, once in Pasuk 27, okay? According to the simple reading, you would think that they were darshaning the second one and saying the second one seems unnecessary, but Rashi is actually going to focus on the fact that it's the first one that's unnecessary because there's a second one, so you don't need the first one. Vishka matamud So why does it say Vishka? It already said Vishka. Now, already in the language of the Bright, it doesn't necessarily mean already before. It could be already after because they don't think they're, it, it doesn't really matter when they talk about this person exists already. You don't need another one. So, again, we'll go with Rashi, who basically says we want to figure out why the first Vishka is there because it already says it in, again, already. Later on, it says it in Pasuk 27. So, why do you need it in Pasuk 24? Well, now we're going to see Rabbi Akiva, which is a totally new thing, not what we were discussing in our Mishnah. Rabbi Akiva says something very interesting, which we're going to, in the end, see nobody disagrees with him. Rabbi Akiva says the extra Vishka has to tell you, we make her drink even when she says she doesn't want to drink. But at what stage? Once the Megillah is erased. Okay, and now, I saw some people ask this question, and I, I was waiting for the proper moment to make Seder out of this. So over Pesach, some people had asked this question. Um, now I'll address it, which is, what are the options in front of a Sota and in front of her husband? Okay, the husband suspects her of being with another woman. If there's witnesses that see that she did, that she actually had relations with the husband, with uh, the, the, the adulterer, then she gets the death penalty, okay? But most of the cases we're discussing here are not the death penalty because we don't have witnesses at all. So we have two options in front of the woman. The woman can either say, I'm guilty. Now, if she says she's guilty, what happens? She immediately gets divorced from her husband. He divorces her, right? He has to divorce her immediately. And she loses her rights to her ketuba money. But she does not get the death penalty. Why does she not get the death penalty? Because we don't convict someone and kill them based on their own testimony. Okay, we don't do that. You can admit to something, but you won't get the death penalty for it, only with witnesses. So she doesn't get the death penalty, she gets divorced, okay? And she loses her ketubah money. If she wants to say, I'm innocent, well, then we go through the SOTA process, okay? But in any given point, until a certain point, and that's our issue here, she can say either, remember we tried, we, we kept saying they want to get her to admit it, or she could say, I'm unwilling to drink the soda waters. Now, whether she admits that I did it, or she just says, I'm unwilling to drink the soda waters, either which way, the same thing happens to her. Okay, it's just a matter of, you know, did she go and admit in court that she was guilty? Or did she say, listen, I'm just too scared. I don't want to drink these waters, even though I really believe I'm innocent. But she gives up on the same rights anyway. She cannot stay married. The husband has to divorce her. And she loses her ketubah money. Okay, so at any point she can really do that and say, listen, I don't want to drink these waters. It disgusts me. I don't want to go through this horrible ceremony. I'd rather just get divorced and move on. Okay, again, she loses a lot of rights. She loses her ketuba money. It's pretty unpleasant for her. Whereas if she's really not guilty, maybe she just wants to go ahead and drink the waters anyway so that she doesn't lose her marriage and, and her ketuba money. Now, she might not want to be married to him anyway after he accused her and all this. So it's not, you know, but she does lose her money which is a big deal. We already learned all about that in the Sephik Tubok. So now we say, though, the following, which is at a certain point, though, she no longer can say, I don't want to drink the waters. And that's once we erase the name of God. And we talked about how serious that erasing the name of God is. And therefore, at a certain point, we don't want to allow her to do that. So that's what Rabbi Akiva says this Pesach is coming to say. That in Nimchakam Gilan, she says, Eini Shota, at that point, it's too late. Okay, we basically say, you know, done. Okay, you have to drink these waters. And that's what he says, the extra vishka. It comes to stress. We are making her drink no matter what. And that's once the waters are erased. Once the text is erased into the waters. Rabbi Shimon Achar yashkem So it's not really a machloket here. Just Rabbi Shimon is going to say, why does it say achar yashkem 
It already says that she drinks. So why does it have to say again after that she drinks the water? Remember, Rabbi Shimon thinks the whole thing happens, right? Probably he's saying, since in Pasuk of Zion it says Vishka, which is after you do the Mincha, then you have to drink. So why does it say, and after you do the Mincha, you drink? It already is clear in Pasuk of Zion, right? He's ignoring 24 right now. We'll get back to 24 later and what he does with that. So therefore, Ela, what it's coming to say, Achar Yashke, is to tell you, He's saying that after, it doesn't just go after the Mincha, it goes back to all the previous things and comes to teach you that after all these things, Yishke, then she could drink the water. So what are these things? He's going to say, Magi, now he says this in other words, the same idea, there's three things that prevent her from drinking the water. Not prevent, meaning we're not going to allow her. But we're basically saying, you have to do these three things before the water gets drunk. What are they? Number one, that's the one that appears exactly in that verse, right? Directly before. You must burn the comets before she drinks the water again. This is Rabbi Shimon. The rabbis disagree. But this is Rabbi Shimon. Number two, Okay, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> Obviously, you have to erase the Megillah before she drinks the water. So the Gemara is going to say, what, why are you bothering to say this? Right? What, what is the water if not? Right? Yeah, it's got the soil in it, but it's also, and the fresh water, but it also has the, the whole, the words. That's pretty basic. We'll talk about that in a minute. The And the oath has to come before, because the oath, again, appeared in the verses before. So that's what the Achar Yashkeh comes to say. These three things have to happen first. So now we're going to go through all those three and where he gets it from, or why is it necessary to say this, or maybe there will be some other problem. Each one, we're going to do something different. Achalot Karava Komets, the first one he said, the Komets has to come first. Well, they just simply say, Rabbi Shimon the Tamei. Rabbi Shimon there is consistent with his opinion. Right? So we already said that. First you have to do it, then you have to, right? First you have to do the Komets, then you drink the water. So that's the first one he said. So what would she be drinking if you didn't erase the, the scroll into the water? What it's coming to teach you, and we'll see in a minute that the rabbis don't disagree with this either. They just get it from a different, they learn it differently. But it's to teach you that if you, let's say, okay, there's two different ways of doing it. We talked about either you scrape off the, the ink or you put it to soak in the water and the ink comes off on its own. Let's say there's no more words, but let's say there's a little bit of the ink still there. That's what it means, rishumonikar. It's still noticed that there's ink on the parchment, meaning the parchment isn't fully blank. That's what it comes to teach you. It's make. You can't drink the water till all the ink is off that scroll. Third one. Ad shalota kabela la What about this oath? Well, now they're going to, they're not going to question why this is. Okay. It's obvious because the oath comes earlier on, but they're going to say the following. It's, if you take this a little bit out of context and look at what he's saying, he's saying, you cannot drink the soda waters until you've done the oath. Okay, That's pretty clear. That's what he said, but you can derive something from there. It says you can't drink the waters, but maybe you can do something else. So mishu deloshakya. But maybe you could write the scroll before the oath. And that's what it sounds like it's saying. Because again, it's sort of, if you look at it from a different perspective, it's saying, this is a, a, a one of these basic inferences they do in the Gemara. It says, right, there's three things here that are ma'akev, the drinking. But it sounds like it's only ma'akev, the drinking, not the writing. So it sounds like if you wrote it before you did the oath, so it would work. But Hama Rava, but Rava says, no, Megillat Sotah Rava says you can't write it before you do the oaths. He says it, it, it's invalid entirely. So that seems to go against, now it doesn't go against what it says here, but it goes against a derivation from here. To which the Gemara says, Naspa. This was just listed here as a third, okay? They were saying, what are things that have to be done before you drink the waters. But it doesn't mean that they also don't have to be done before you write the Megillah. It just wasn't before you write the scroll. It just wasn't referring to that. So in the end, they say, don't worry about that inference. It's not a real inference from here. You don't have to infer it. Okay. Now we get back to the basic Mechlok. So what we saw here so far, okay, just to be clarifying, let's go to the chart. 
We saw here, we'll start with Rabbi Akiva. We saw Rabbi Akiva who said, Vihishka, let's just go with Rashi in the first Vihishka, is there to teach you, you must make her drink if you've already erased the Megillah. According to Rabbi Shimon, again, they're not really arguing. Rabbi Shimon says, why does it say Vahar Yashkeat Haisha when it already says Vihishka? Uh, that's to teach you after all the things you saw before. Number one, the Kmitza. Number two, the er Megillah being erased. And number three, the oath. Only after all those three things can she drink the water. He's basically saying it's the very last action that you do. Okay? That's Rabbi Shimon. Now we're going to try to understand where the rabbis get off disagreeing with Rabbi Shimon about the order and how do they understand these verses that we already showed were very confusing. Okay? So we're going to start with the words by my kamifuge. We're right almost in the middle of Yudhetim of Bet. Tlata Kraiktive. Okay, they're basically summarizing what we already saw. There's three sukim where it says Vishka. Kapdalid, Vihishka Kama. They call that the first Vihishka. Kapdalid, 24. Vahar Yash, and that's before the Mincha. Vahar Yashke is after the Mincha, and then she'll drink the water. Vishka Batra, and then it also says again, and he makes her drink. So, how are we going to read these three psukim according to the rabbis and according to Rabbi Shem? Rabbanan Safri, Vihishka Kama Legufo. The first Hishka is coming to teach you the basic law, which is Shemashkava Harkach Makrivit Minchata. It comes in verse 24. In verse 25, it brings the Mincha. So clearly, you drink and then you bring the Mincha. And this is why the rabbis didn't need to bring their proof pasuk in the, in the Mishnah because it was so obvious. It says she drinks and then they bring the Mincha. So obviously, that's the order. Obviously, it's not so obvious because Rabbi Shimon disagrees, but the simple reading is that. So now what's he going to do with, and after that she drinks the water, when it was, the after seems to be referring to the mencha, which goes against what they said. Well, it doesn't have to do with the mencha. Achar yashke means after you erase it completely. And this, here he he does agree with Rabbi Shimon this, the here you learn Rishimoni Kar from the same Pasuk. He just doesn't say there's three things that are Ma'akvim. He says it just has to be erased completely. And that's what it's coming to say, which again is a little bit hard to say because Achar Yashke is in the verse about the Mincha, not about erasing or anything, but it's referring back to previously where they talked about erasing the, the, uh, the scroll. Vishka Batra. So now what's the third one coming for? Ah. That one's coming for, I told you, he doesn't disagree with Rabbi Akiva. He just disagrees about where you get it from. The second vihishka, or the third actually, but the second time it says the word vihishka, right? Achar yashke is the other pasuk, but vihishka appears twice. She'im nimchaka migila v'omerek eni shota marerino ta mashkeno ta ba'al korcha. If once we erase the Megillah and she decides, I don't want to drink these waters, we force her to drink them. Okay, so that's Tanakama. So again, the first one is the order. The second one is to say every single part has to be erased. And the third is to say we force her to do it at this stage. Rabbi Shimon Saval v'achar yashke legufo. This is what he said in the Mishnah. Achar yashke is teaching you the basic halacha. Mincha is offered and only then does she drink. Shema kriva mincha tava achar mashka. Right? The first the mincha, then she drinks. Vihishka kama. So what do you do with that first? Right? The first one is the most problematic for him. Why does it say you drink the waters before the mincha if that's not how we do it? Well, if you remember, Rabbi Shimon says if you do it in the opposite order, it works, even though you shouldn't do it that way. That's what he said that first one comes to teach you. That if you did it in the wrong order, it would work anyway. Okay? That's the halacha of the vihishka rishon. The first vihishka comes to say, this isn't the main place you're supposed to do it, but if you did it there, it would work also. Vihishka Batra, what about the third reference? Why do you need that? Achar Yashke already tells you what comes after the Mincha, so what do you need Vihishka to come after that again? Again, he's gonna, this is the one point where they agree, him and the rabbis. Okay, that again, if she decides she doesn't want to drink, it's too late. They force her to drink. So now, the last thing we have to figure out in this section before we get to Rabbi Akiva is Virabanam, why don't the rabbis think? that Rabbi Shimon's right, and that the first tishka is only if you did it that way. But really, in the, we said the simple reading matches the rabbis. It says she drinks, and then the mincha. On the other hand, the rabbis don't, right? The rabbis are stuck with, 
The simple reading also says, after that, the woman drinks. So why don't they say, like Rabbi Shimon, that the first one is B'dyevet? So they have a very simple answer. B'dyevet lo patach kra. It doesn't make sense that the very first mention of the drinking is the, is the default. You know, the, if you did it that way, it'll work, the post facto one. It doesn't make any sense to say that, and that's why they disagree with him. Okay. Now we're going to go to Rabbi Akiva. We're now going to bring a contradiction. We're going to have two contradictions within Rabbi Akiva. The first one we'll see today, the next one at the top of tomorrow's daf. Rabbi Akiva basically said very clearly, and he agreed with Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis about this, that right? if you erase the Megillah, she can no longer opt out. So the Gemara is going to question that from something else Rabbi Akiva says. Is that really the case? Vahatanya doesn't it say in a bright to Rabbi Yehuda Omel? Okay, if you thought that Sota ceremony was unpleasant so far, here's another unpleasantry. According to Rabbi Yehuda, Kalbus shel barzel metilim letochpia. She'in nimchaka megila v'amra eni shota, ma'arino tau mashkinot ha'ba'al korcha. You ever try to give your kids medicine and they don't want to take it? Right? And you say, like, how am I going to get the kid to drink the medicine? And you try to put it down their throat. It's a very unpleasant experience if you ever had to do that. So what did they do for the woman? Since there was a point where they forced the woman to drink, they basically would put this implement in her mouth made of, of iron, barzel, and they would basically, right, keep her mouth open so she couldn't shut it. So she would have no choice but to drink the water. Okay? This is part of the ceremony, according to Rabbi Yehuda. It sounds like not everybody does this, but agreed that we do this. But according to Rabbi Yehuda, they would put something to be able to make sure that she didn't back down at the end. Now, it sounds very, very unpleasant. On the other hand, you could imagine that the woman, and we're, we'll talk about this soon, right? It comes down to drinking it. It's very scary. Even if you're innocent, by the way, it's scary to drink this water. If this water does something to you when you're guilty, right? Wouldn't you think maybe it'll affect me anyway, right? It's very scary. So you could imagine she might choke up and not want to do it and close her throat and, you know, not allow it. So basically they had to come up with some solution. Again, this is not, this is talking theoretics also because this never happened. But theoretically they were thinking about all possible scenarios. It was possible she wouldn't want to drink. So they would put this in term. Comes Rabbi Akiva, now this shows right, that they would force her. Comes Rabbi Akiva and disagrees. I'm a Rabbi Akiva. Isn't the whole purpose of this just to check her? If she's guilty, if she's not guilty. But this woman, if she's unwilling to drink the waters, what better proof do we have that she's guilty? She's obviously guilty, and if she's guilty, we don't even need the waters anymore. If you are, now, if this is, this is um, different from what I said before, which is maybe she's scared. We're going to get to that in a minute. But right now, Rabbi Akiva's assuming if the woman doesn't want to drink the waters, why wouldn't she want to drink the waters? Because she knows she's guilty. At that point, if she says, I refuse to drink the waters, is that not an admission of guilt? And as I told you before, if she admits she's guilty, then what? Then we basically assume that she, if she's guilty and admits her guilt, she doesn't have to drink the waters. She just immediately gets divorced and loses her ketubah money. So why don't we just go with that if she's unwilling to drink the water? So we don't need to force her, according to Rabbi Akiva. Now that disagrees with what we just said, that we do need to force her. What gets more confusing before they even get there is the continuation of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva right now says she doesn't have to drink. But in a second, he's going to say she does. So we do force her. So it's a little bit confusing. The Gemara is going to deal with that. Ella, he basically distinguishes. And he says the following. If you haven't brought them in offering yet, she can change her mind and she doesn't have to drink the water. That matches what he just said. But Misha Karava comments, once you do the meat and you burn it, at that point, she can't change her mind. We force her to drink the water. So now they, before they even get to the, con the contradiction was obvious, he already said you don't have to drink the waters. And they already said he did have to drink the waters. But now they're going to say, what you're saying, Rabbi Akiva says in one source, she has to drink the waters. And the other source says she doesn't have to drink the waters. But even in the source where she doesn't have to drink the waters, even that, right, it doesn't make any sense. Because it says, right? On the other hand, right, it says, one place said she does have to, one place said she doesn't have to. So now, Rabbi Akiva himself distinguished between whether the mincha was offered or wasn't offered. And he does say at a certain point, she can't change her mind. So it doesn't make any sense. Soon we're going to get to tomorrow, 
Here he says it's all dependent on the bringing of the mencha, and in the, in the top of Amud Bet, he said it's all dependent on the erasing of the waters. That's another contradiction we're going to have to deal with. So right now, to answer this contradiction, they're now going to first answer the contradiction within the Brite itself, and that's going to become our answer to the contradiction between Rabbi Yekiva and the first Brite and the second Brite. Lokash. Hada kahad rabba machmat ketita. Hada kahad rabba machmat briyuta. Okay, when it says... Misha Karava Komet saying, I cholalach Zorba, she can't change her mind anymore, which seems right, she can't. And yet it says, we don't have to check her anymore because she's obviously admitting her guilt. So those are going to be two different reasons why she's changing her mind. And how they figure this out is a good question. Maybe they look at her facial expressions, her body language. I don't know, but there's a difference between, we talked about this before, a woman who's just scared to drink it, and that's what I mentioned just previously, or a woman who's actually fine and healthy and just says, oh, I'm not drinking these waters. And this is how you read it. If she's very confident and says, I'm not drinking these waters, and it's not that she's scared, then we assume it's because she's guilty. And then we don't make her drink the waters because there's no point. It's already, she's like admitting her guilt. And that's when he said, When he then distinguishes between we're talking about ritita. If she's scared, and that's why she doesn't want to drink it, it depends on where what stage we're up to. What's the comments? Ah, because we haven't yet erased the waters yet. We haven't done the Kmitza, which means we haven't erased the, the Megillah yet, the scroll. Or or maybe they erased the scroll too early. If the Konim erased the scroll too early, well, that's not her problem. Then Matse Hadraba, she can still turn around and go back and say, I don't want to drink this. And then we're on to, remember, there were two options. She could either admit her guilt or she can say, I just don't want to drink these waters. And then again, the same thing happens to her. It's just, she's not admitting her guilt. She might still be innocent, but it doesn't matter. She still needs to get divorced and loses her ketuba money. Misha kahava comets, but once you bring the comets, dibedin abikonim demake, where they then erase the Megillah according to the law, because they did it in the right place, lo matse hadrabe. Then she can't change her mind anymore. And that is what, how we're going to explain the contradiction, also between the first bright. When the first bride just says, if the Megillah is erased and she doesn't want to drink, we force her to, that's in a case where she doesn't want to drink out of fear, not out of a place of confidence where she's basically saying, I'm clearly guilty. Okay, so the same way we, do, we resolve the inner contradiction within that bride to itself, where Rabbi Kiva on one hand said we don't force her, and the other hand he said we do force her, that's the same way we resolve the contradiction between the two bride tones. Okay, so quick, quick review of our daf. I know it's late, but we started with those three opinions about can a woman can we force her to drink soda water? I'm uh, sorry, can we not force? Does she drink soda water twice or not? Could there be a scenario, yes or no? We saw three different options, the right, in all extremes. Then we talked about this big debate between the order. We also talked about the waving, how they do the waving. They learned it out from the shlamin. Then we go to this machloga between the rabbis and Rabbi Shimon about the order. From there, we also saw a different, the whole problem of these three languages of vihishka, and one before the mincha and two after the mincha. How do we view the order? What does Rabbi Akiva do with that pasuk? He has a different drush on it. And Rabbi Shimon and the rabbis darshan each of those to basically support their reading. And then we ended with this inner contradiction with Indivir Rabbi Akiva himself. And as I said, tomorrow we'll get to another contradiction and that contradiction will be resolved. Okay, and with that, we got to this idea of forcing the woman at a certain point, only at the very late stage, do we actually force her to drink the water. Whereas at the earlier stages, she can always change her mind. And within that, we talked about what are all the possible tracks that this woman could go on once she's accused of being a soto. With that, we'll finish for today. Have a great day, everybody.